Legendary warriors, they have lived and died, but they still live on in the minds of thousands. Who hasn't heard of the big black bad dog? The amazing bully son Jr. Was he a myth? Perhaps. But if there's one man who can tell the inside story of the renowned bully son, he is Sir Bobby Hall of Houston, Texas. This is the story of a man and his dog. Bobby Hall and Bully Son. A duo that made the world tremble. When the plane landed in Houston, Texas, it was already dark, but the warm, humid air was still present. After a quick trip to the Hilton and the following drinks in the hotel bar, I went back to my room and relaxed. I was trying to relax and thinking about the questions I was going to ask Bobby Hall the next day. I've spent the last few days reading Bully Son and his sons. I wonder when all the great dogmans got together to determine who is the best ring dog. I was just a few hours away from meeting Sir Bobby Hall. I was about to meet one of the greatest dogmen of all time. Imagining this, I went to sleep. The next morning, the day dawned sunny, humid, and the day started early. At my breakfast, I began to concentrate on the meeting I was going to have with Mr. Bob Hall. After I got back to my room, my concentration was interrupted as I received a phone call. And in a soft, friendly voice, he asked me if I was ready for my complimentary continental breakfast. He said, Are you okay, boy? And he told me he was Mr. Bobby Hall. All I know is that I landed at the wrong airport in Houston, and he insisted on picking me up at my hotel. It arrived in less than 45 minutes. When I opened the door, I was impressed. He had a big smile on his face, a Texas hat, and he looked me in the eye. It looked like he was trying to analyze my thoughts. He was with a nice young man named Rudy Flink of Ligel, who was from Holland. Bobby had trouble pronouncing his name, and he called him Finkelwinkle. When I got to his house, the door was opened by a tall lady. She was attractive and had brown eyes, she was his wife, Jeanette. The day went by and we were talking about dogs, had a few drinks, and lots of good food. Her house was surrounded by dogs on the chain. And inside it there were many trophies, there were many photos and other souvenirs of champion dogs. Dogs, which were known in the past. When dog fighting was not yet illegal. And it was popular sport for people to watch. The back porch was full of wallpaper pictures of famous bulldogs and people like Danny Burton, Norman Hooten, and many other dogmen from all over the world. The night was filled with stories and lots of drinking. It was obvious that Bobby had more than just a story, and that a good interview was about to begin. Talking to Bobby was like reading his book, interesting, instructive, and, above all, great fun. We were more comfortable now, and the stage was set. Early the next morning, as we sat in the shade of the porch, we were having a cup of good coffee, which his wife Jeanette made. I turned on the recorder, it was very quiet, the only sound was the female Mrs. Boobs, who was sleeping next to us. She was a brindle female, and Bobby's favorite dog. She was silent when I asked my first question. Mr. Hall, what is a good bulldog? And without looking at me, he replied in his typical meek voice. Well, first of all, a dog that is gameness above all else. Then the second would be a hard ring biter, just like Tyson. A dog that can finish off its opponent in less than twenty minutes. There are few like that, and I also like a suffocating dog. I prefer one of these more than any other. I didn't expect that kind of response. So, I asked, but why? And why do you like dogs of gameness? And he promptly replied, 
A dog of gameness is one who will crawl, will fall, will stumble, and will still catch up with his opponent, even after he is exhausted. Slowly he placed his arms on the table and continued. If you have a smothering dog, it's like getting into a fight, and you close your guard, and they hit you on the back. You won't be used to it. In other words, they won't give up, they'll keep hitting. It's a true style, and one that confuses dogs a lot. You will be able to finish, before the fight starts. I realized that I was getting a little out of his knowledge, I continued to question. Can you give me an example of a gameness dog? Yes, of course I can. The dog he lost to Bully Sun was the best example I've ever seen of that. He showed about 300 people what a gameness dog looks like. He lost the match, but received a standing ovation from the crowd. That was almost 20 years ago, but it's rare that you see a dog like that. Just before I get to my next question, Mrs. Jeanette left the house with a cell phone. It was Mr. Teddy Bear from the Tokyo area. While he was talking to her friend, I rewound the tape deck to see if it was recording. Fortunately, it was perfect. While Bobby was still on the phone, I went through my list of questions. I decided to ask him about Ben's bobtail dog that fought in Taiwan. I thought of asking, too, about the bitch princess who many said she went to Mexico. When Bobby got off the phone and came back, he came back smiling, and I asked the other question. But he came back to the subject and said, A true gameness dog is very rare. For me, a pedigree is not as important as the quality of the dog. What matters is the individual quality of the dog. And when you start breeding, you'll see that only once in a while, that a super dog will be born. This will cost you time and money. And you will understand how difficult it is for a creator. And how complex it is, the creation of the fighting dog. The princess Miz. Boobs, she's my old Robert's daughter. She is a bully son granddaughter. I think she was my best female. She would definitely be among the best. She beat a respected bitch in Colorado. Princess is now owned by a gentleman named Arnold. He is from Monterey, Mexico. But he always comes to the States. Ben the dog is a different story. I bought him from a man named Biscuit and trained him for six months. Then I sold her to Mr. Bitch Dog. A very nice man from Taiwan. He booked a match against Grand Champion Mikey, and he won the match. I thought the dog was in top form considering the caliber of dog he chose. Then they made the mistake of matching the dog too soon. There were only three months left until their next match, which was too soon. Although he won that fight as well, he wasn't in the shape he should have been. By this time, we were really focused on the interview. Then I thought it was a good time to change the subject to more serious issues. I realized that in the next few minutes, from a conversation with friends, we were going to move on to an interesting interview. I waited a few seconds and asked the next question. Mr. Hall, Bully Sun is considered by many to be one of the greatest dogs of all time. And you wrote a book called Bully Sun and His Sons. Why didn't you write about the fight between Bully Sun and Benny Bob? Since this is a fight which generated a lot of controversy. Well, at the time I was writing it, I had to stop writing. I had been writing for three years, and I couldn't finish the book. My new book will come out in 1989, and I'll pick up where I left off. The next book will be Sons of Bully Sons. There was a lot of controversy about Bully Sun. Some information true, and some false. But the whole truth will be related in my next book. There will be a lot of interesting things to talk about. I will go into each of his children. Of course it takes a lot of time to research, 
and get all the facts straight. And that's the kind of book I'm trying to do. The answer was honest, but Bobby was certainly avoiding the essence of the question. I wasn't quite satisfied and decided to try a more direct approach. And said, Mr. Bobby, according to several people who witnessed Bully Son and Benny Bob fight. Which is Maurice Carver, who manipulated Bully Son. Said he took it before the count ended because he wasn't coming back. Also, several years ago, Mr. Don Mayfield, and also Bobby Smith, sent articles to various magazines, and those articles said that Maurice failed to get Bullison back in the fight. And it also said that Maurice asked Floyd Boudreau if he could get Bullison back in the fight, but it was all in vain. What do you have to say about this? Bobby, who was sitting to my right, turned his head slightly. And looking at me, he replied slowly. Well, that's true, but it's just one way to lose. I see it like this. The fight is over. Someone had to win. Then someone had to lose. But what bothers me is why the dog men don't focus on breeding themselves. A man with common sense who has actually read and researched will realize that Bully Son was a 50-pound dog. Benny Bob easily reached 24 kilos. So even Ray Charles would see that. When you have two good dogs, you can't give up two kilos. I would say Bully Son was a dead game animal. So I interrupted Bobby's analysis, and I asked, Even if he didn't fight back? Okay, he was definitely in shock, no doubt. You have no idea what kind of dog Benny Bob was, and how he could bite. You would have to be there to know what kind of bully son dog you were up against. And one thing is for sure, to say that his own son killed him is a compliment to himself. I was listening to his answer, and I was fascinated by the ease with which he answered me. After reading his book, that was the only question that was burning in my mind. As if the bitch Mrs. Boobs could sense my arousal, she began to bark, producing a low, deep sound. Owner Jeanette sat next to us so she could follow the rest of the interview. So I asked, Do you know what happened to Benny Bob? After the fight with Bully Son? Yes, I know he went back to Willie Brown's backyard, and then he went to California. He was matched against Ralph Greenwood's Jimmy Boots. This fight was the best, and also the cruelest I've ever seen. It was like you were watching it, and you were sure it wouldn't last another five minutes. It really was like two grown men with ice picks facing each other. You just knew you couldn't go more than five minutes, but you did. And then you were sure again that it was impossible to continue. The whole fight went like this. You knew the fight had to end because there weren't two dogs that could take that kind of punishment. I've never been in a fight like this before. Rick Halliburton and Willie Brown did conditioning on Benny Bob. And Ralph Greenwood did the conditioning on Jimmy Boots. Both dogs were in great shape. Did you condition Bullison to fight Benny Bob? No, Maurice Carver who conditioned him, but I didn't feel he was in good shape. Not that it matters much, because he couldn't have one, even on his best day. You can't give that kind of weight against dogs that are equal fighters. After I sold Bully Son to Red Walling, he put me on as the manager of the best dog in the world in that weight class. I even challenged his litter brother, Eli Jr., but he shouldn't have fought Benny Bob. At that point, I changed the subject. And I asked, Mr. Bobby, and your stud Bert? Where did you buy it? And he told me. Bert was about five years old, and I bought him from Dennis Meyer, who owned him. He got the dog from Don Maloney's wife. She gave the dog to Dennis. 
Dennis helped Don work with his puppy in his first fight. She really liked Dennis. She couldn't take care of the dog after Don's tragic death. Bobby. Bert is not open to public breeding service. I will only use it on my female dogs. A while ago I had a dog named Bowser. He won twice in about an hour. Bowser was a great dog, but he had a problem. He didn't like the treadmill, but luckily, you could drop him in a lake, and he'd stay there all day until he couldn't walk anymore. I sold Bowser to a friend of mine. His name was Shankbone. That's when Bird appeared. He defeated the Browser. The fight lasted almost two hours, and I couldn't believe it. The next thing I heard my good friend Danny Burton and his friend Tony. They had also lost to Bert, with a two-fight winning dog. After that, I started to analyze the dog. I called someone in Oklahoma because I knew Dennis lived in the country and didn't have a phone. So I paid this man $50 to go to this little town and tell Dennis to call me. So I met Dennis in a place called Bowie, Texas. When he brought the dog into my motel room, I was reminded of a great warrior. The scars on his body were visible, and he was practically 90% scar tissue. I took the dog home. At that time he weighed only 20 kilograms. What really made me buy Bert was that Dennis told me how he conditioned him. And he revealed to me that he prepared Bert, training only 8 kilometers a day and the training was running after a truck. It showed me that old Bert won the last two fights strictly in his heart. In other words, he would just stop dead. At the time, he brought along a sixth-generation pedigree. I knew almost every pedigree dog. I was so happy to get Bert the dog, I can't even tell you how happy I was. After I lost my stud Robert who had cancer, and died at the age of 13. I started my search, looking for a breeder. I was looking for a super dog. I wanted one more outcross that clicked with the blood of my bully son. I was looking for a breeder for a long time. So this dog was a dream come true. He is a perfect breeding dog. At that exact moment, Rudy appeared on the scene. He was busy with a little black dog named Catfish. This puppy belonged to Bobby, who had bought the puppy a few weeks earlier. He was conditioning him to get in better shape. Looking at Rudy reminded me of what Bobby had told me. He spoke about many young people who were always visiting him trying to learn more. And especially learning to condition a dog. Bobby referred to these men as students. And he himself would have been student of Maurice Carver. I decided to ask him about his vision in relation to modern dogmen from 20 to 30 years ago. And he replied, The student you are working with today will be the teacher of tomorrow. It takes a lot of time and effort to help someone. Sometimes it's like wasting time. Sometimes they don't work, and that's what it's about. I have people coming from England, Holland and Tokyo, mostly young people under 30. I have a lot of respect for them because they don't give up. They are like a good dog, they behave very well. They work their dogs faithfully, and they are great students. They remind me of myself 30 years ago. When the dog men were older, they didn't even teach how to rub a dog, much less get into the real part, which brings a good dog. I sold Swamper Dog to Alan Sonke from England. He is doing great with the dog. Everyone wants to mate with his dog. I had won four fights with Dog Swamper. I beat the dog Joe Joe, who was a famous dog. I, too, sold the jailhouse to England to a gentleman named David Hill. Before sending jailhouse, she was bred to my champion Bert. They had nine puppies. I also sold a very good bitch to Peter O'Donnell. Her name was Shorty, and she was also the mother of nine puppies. I truly believe that.
especially in the last ten years, many serious dog men have appeared. They bought some of my best. If they watch what they're doing, they'll have better dogs than we have here. Do you believe that Europeans are capable of competing at the same level when it comes to conditioning and quality of dogs? They are doing great and have made tremendous progress over the last 10 years. They may not have as many good dogs as we do, but the dogs are getting better. They also learned a lot about conditioning. Give them five more years and take care. What about people in Taiwan? Rudy had stopped again, and Miss Jeanette went to take another call. The conversation had been very satisfying so far. One of my last questions was the conditioning part. By this time, one of Bobby's friends, Jerry Stein, from Austin. He sat next to us. It was still morning, I took a quick look at my watch. I realized I only had 90 minutes to finish the interview, get to the airport, and catch my plane back to my home in Nashville. So I asked, What was your relationship with Maurice Carver? Maurice, you are a unique person, and the most interesting person I have ever met. There will never be another like him. People who are like Maurice are few and far between. Frank Fitzwater and Ralph Greenwood are two of them. Ralph's death recently made me very sad. We didn't have much of an age difference, and he was a true friend. He knew every person I've met over the last 30 years. These people are irreplaceable. They are gone and it hurts. He looked at me for a few seconds without saying a word. His smile was gone, but his eyes were still pointed in my direction. In a strange way, I felt sadness wash over me. It was the same feeling that I had a few weeks before, my friend Bobby Smith went to San Antonio and walked through the lands that Maurice Carver lived in for so many years. The house he lived in was in ruins, but there were still many things that reminded him of Carver's life and the famous dogs that lived in this place. Later on the phone, Bobby told me that Maurice was still alive and will always be remembered for the great personality he was. Sir Bobby Hall Can you tell me if you use steroids on your dogs? And also how do you feed them? And how do you make them work? Well, the work starts slowly. He responded instantly. Any dog needs at least 90 days, and if it's a beginner dog, I would say it needs 5 months because you will make many mistakes. I'll start with maybe five minutes on the treadmill, then ten minutes to cool down and work my way back until I've done about thirty minutes of exercise, five minutes, which is nothing for a dog. Then the second month I would work up to what I call eight hours a day. That means walking and etc. doesn't mean your dog is going to be running around on the treadmill or the mill all day. But you'll spend the whole day working that dog, walking him, giving him a massage, and so on. I use the mat and the mill, but I prefer the mat. The reason I switch from the treadmill to the mill is so the dog doesn't get bored within a certain amount of time. And like a new toy for him, you switch to something else. I feed once a day, feed the dogs twice a day. It's just a waste of energy for me. Food is very important. For the beginner, I would say buy some science diet or ANF dog food. Both I like because they retain more fluid from your dog. I feed raw light ground beef, and also give a lot of chicken broth. I boil the broth with garlic. The broth will help keep the liquid in the dog. He will need to not dehydrate. So you will have a dog much stronger. With a dehydrated dog, you have nothing but a shell. As far as steroids are concerned, I cannot reveal my secrets. Because that is the key to victory. I only share this with the kind of students I believe in. Who will remain a really serious dogman. Whenever you use the word steroid, people tend to overreact, 
as if you were using another dog. The only thing I believe. It's about getting the dog a little help. I don't use steroids during training. Also, you must remember that steroids lower the dog's resistance to infection. And they won't have immunity if they get sick. You really have to know how to use steroids. It's not something you can play around with. Can you be a little more specific about the type of steroids you're talking about? No, I can't because people would give a fortune just to know what I use. Then Jerry Stein got up and went to get his second cup of coffee. My plane was only an hour away from taking off, and I knew it would take at least 45 minutes to get to the airport. But Bobby assured me there was nothing to worry about and that he would drive me to the airport. I looked at the notes I made on a piece of paper throughout the interview and asked Bobby about the use of special vitamins or a hormone called asium and if he believed that a dog with a lot of liquid in the body would warm up faster than a dog with less liquid. He continued to answer the last question first. They will definitely warm up if you don't have that many hours a day with them. The right thing is to work eight hours a day, seven days a week. If he's used to it, his body is used to working hard while under stress. So you'll have to keep enough fuel in it so it can go on for a long time. It's like a race car. When they run out of gas, they will stop. And it's the same with any animal, horse, dog, or whatever. Vitamins are something I really believe in. But again I repeat, knowing how to get the right thing is an art. It takes years of experience to learn what to give, and how much to give. Because if you give too much of anything, it can hurt you. Vitamins are very, very important. Equally important, working a dog for me. About the use of asium, I would like to say to the beginner. The beginner doesn't know when to put the asium on, that's the sad part about it. It's a drug they have no knowledge of, when at its peak, or whatever. So I wouldn't suggest anything to a beginner because they would do more harm than good. Again, Using this kind of thing takes experience, and it's not something you give it, and it works. I agreed with your last answer, but I couldn't stop wondering if this answer would actually be helpful for any real beginners trying to learn. I decided to go talk to a pharmacist about this matter as soon as I had the chance. I had no more than 50 minutes to go to the airport when I got to my last question for Bobby Hall. We were alone and next to the ever-sleeping Mrs. Boobs, there was not a sound disturbing this perfect, beautiful Texas Sunday morning in Houston. Mr. Hull, last question. Who is your best friend? Once again, he looked me straight in the eyes, his face was smiling, and without the slightest hesitation, he answered me with a voice full of love. My wife Jeanette. The trip to the airport was a quick one and just seconds before the plane closed the door, I collapsed into my seat, trying to catch my breath after a run that would have made A.J. Foyt jealous. High above the world, gliding so easily from cloud to cloud, I thought about what Bobby Hall had told me and what I had learned from the visit. I thought about what he said to me once in his car. If you want to succeed, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication. And there's no way I could have done otherwise, Bobby Hall, a man who was clearly driven to become what he eventually became. And that he's a first-class dogman, and that's his prize for hard work. My name is Rodolfo Luis, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Sign up so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went.